Hi, Bill Mobley for The Brain Channel on UCTV. We're talking again about autism, this extremely prevalent and very difficult disorder, something that impacts so negatively the lives of kids and has such a powerful influence on their families as well. With me is Karen Pierce, who's professor of neurosciences at UCSD. Karen, welcome, and let's start with the, with the definition of autism or autism spectrum disorder. Okay, well, uh, autism spectrum disorder is a disorder that affects the way somebody socially interacts, the way somebody kind of perceives their environments, what they're interested in. It's a neurobiological disorder, so it impacts the way the brain grows and functions. Um, and it's interesting because it's very heterogeneous. Autism looks very different in different people. Some people with autism uh, can't talk, while other people can go on and get a college degree and work and even get married. And so this poses a really interesting conundrum for a scientist to try to parse this heterogeneity. There's a very, very large spectrum. Um, but one of the fundamental defining features is this really big challenge with social interaction and understanding the minds of others. You know, it's, uh, it's really so interesting. When I was in college, uh, the concept <clears throat> that was put forward was of the refrigerator mother, that somehow the mothers of these young babies were somehow responsible for inducing these changes that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's even painful to even think about that. Mm -hmm. It was completely toxic, completely wrong. We know now that autism begins in the womb. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that what we see at autopsy or postmortem tissue, for example, increased number of cells. We know that cells are generated prenatally, you know, prenatally during, you know, throughout a couple of um, first two trimesters, mainly in babies. And so, if you're seeing abnormal numbers of, of cells, that definitely suggests that autism is a prenatal disorder. Um, so, what happens is not caused postnatally by a vaccine, by something somebody did. Um, there might be some interactions with environment postnatally, but largely, what's going on with autism is prenatally. So, we've gone beyond that really uninformed time of thinking that uh, maternal behavior had something to do with that. What we are very much aware of, though, is that this brain disorder developing very early has a huge impact on the lives of these young folks. Before you get into that and talk more, tell us about you. Okay, well, I've been studying autism for a very, very long time. I started out my career very interested in treatment because I so much wanted to help kids with autism. And then I realized, you know, treatment is very labor intensive and I spent a really long time just helping a handful of children. Uh, mainly I used to target social behaviors. And then I realized you know, autism is a neurobiological disorder. I'm spending way too much time with just a couple of kids. If I understood the neurobiology a little bit better and started thinking about it at that level, at, at kind of a more of a local level, then maybe we'd be able to one day develop better treatments that could help kids. So my research is kind of spans the gamut of clinical, to eye tracking, to functional brain imaging, and I collaborate on genetic studies. And so what kind of my biggest interest in autism right now is early detection. We know from animal model studies that the brain is very plastic, particularly during early development. And if you can provide an enriched environment during those first precious months, early years of life, you have the greatest chance of changing the way the brain grows and functions. And so there are a couple of studies in autism showing that early treatment actually results in changes in IQ, better outcomes. And so if we can just figure out how to detect it very early, then I think it's gonna really help the kids get on a great course in life. The mean age right now is four or five in America, and that's just way too late. Yeah, so four or five years really yeah. is uh, four years, nine months after this disease, this disorder actually begins. Early diagnosis, is difficult, but you've really pioneered in that. T yeah. Tell us what you've done. Yeah, it, it, it is very difficult because when a child is really young, it's really hard to know if they might just have a language delay or if something specific to autism. Also, there are a lot of barriers to early detection. For example, some pediatricians don't know what to look for. or They don't use a standardized screening tool. Parents are unsure. I mean, there's just a whole host of issues why it, it becomes a really a late diagnosis issue for many kids. So what we've done to remedy that is we've kind of joined forces with pediatricians in multiple cities throughout the country because pediatricians are the first line of defense. We've set up a network here in San Diego of 170 pediatricians, gave them a validated screening tool to use at Well Baby Checks that, that catch kids with all delays, not just autism. Because you can't, it's really hard to definitely detect autism, let's say, at 12 months for, for definite sure, or 18 months or 24 months, because the symptoms come online 
Um, they become more and more glaring at different ages. There's a lot of heterochronicity in symptom onset for kids. So you work with pediatricians, give them validated tools, have them screened at multiple ages. And in San Diego, we've been detecting kids um, at 12 months, getting them into treatment at 15 or 16 months. And it's been really successful. We've also moved out into Phoenix. So it really starts with mobilizing pediatricians and getting them actively engaged and involved. And then having a great place to go for an evaluation following uh, the screening tool use. You know, that's remarkable because there aren't really um, a lot of examples of people working on developmental disorders that have made such a great connection with the folks that see these kids first off, the pediatricians. So, so it's been great for your program, but it's also great for the families that have their kids screened because they're able now to know with somewhat greater confidence that there's a problem or there's no problem. That's right, and we can get them onto track, but it's also great uh, for the field of science because then the kids enroll in our studies and we're really determined to find early biomarkers. Because right now, if you are worried your child might have autism, if you're not in a hotbed of research like San Diego or San Francisco or something, it could take years. So we know it's a biological disorder. There should be objective markers. So what are they? How are we gonna find them? One of the things that I do is I've developed um, a couple of eye tracking tests because visual attention is very objective and quantitative. And a typical baby, they're drawn to the human face. They cannot help it. You know, from seconds after birth, they are riveted to the human face. And some kids with autism, their attention is not always necessarily socially directed, and so we can use eye tracking to quantify that. I developed this test called the Geometric Preference Test for Autism, where a baby sits down in their mom's lap, they get to see geometric shapes moving around, or they get to see children jumping around. And I found a subtype of ASD that preferentially look at the geometric shapes, whereas virtually none. We've tested almost 1,000 kids by now. None of the typically developing kids do that greater than 69% of the time. But 20% of kids with autism, they will just focus on those geometric shapes and ignore the kids. Um, and that's, uh, that's a really unique, interesting subtype, and we're gonna be following up on that because I mean, if you think about it, you know, there are experienced impediment mechanisms that happen to help shape brain development during early life. And so if you have a, a toddler who is riveted you know, to this cup instead of your face, and they do that day after day, looking at the wrong place at the wrong time, they're not getting the input that they need to stimulate their brain. So, and, but interestingly, it's only 20%. A lot of kids with autism, they do a great job. They look at the faces. Um, and we're predicting that those are the kids that are gonna have the better long-term outcome. So we're using eye tracker not just as a diagnostic biomarker, but also as a pro potential prognostic biomarker, because that's, that's important. Right now, even if you do get a provisional diagnosis of autism as a parent, the clinician cannot tell you really much of anything. Like the mom might say, well, what's in store for my child? What should I do? Where is he going? Nobody really knows, and really people don't know. And so eye tracking might give us a little bit of a clue of the subtype or the kind of the symptom profile that's special to your child and what you might expect and what you might have to work on to really help your child the most. So these, these biological signatures vary from person to person, but they're all, they're, some are predictive of later problems and really a diagnosis of autism. It sounds like then the brain of these different folks is different. I mean, if, if, if I enjoy eye contact, but that's I right. still develop autism. That Obviously, right. I'm not the same as the kid right. who has that a problem. Is, that's exactly right. Um, and it's, it's great that you should say that because we are the next kind of frontier, I would love to do combination eye tracking brain imaging studies mm. to really understand the inner workings of the brain. But right now, we do brain imaging studies with infants with autism. Right? You can't do uh, that when they're awake because they're not going to hold still for you as much as you might try. So we do natural sleep imaging. Um, so mom you know, gets their baby really tired, brings them down to the scanner, and we scan them during natural sleep. But because they're sleeping, you know, it's not really lending itself to the visual modality. I can't do visual attention studies while a baby's asleep particularly well. So we're doing a lot of auditory studies looking at the auditory system. And we have found another interesting subtype. Some kids with autism have really a lot of hypoactivation in the superior temporal gyrus, which is a place in the brain that's really responsible for language processing. Um, and again, some kids do well and some kids don't. So we are gonna see maybe if there's um, a relationship there, but really ultimately we should be doing things like ERPs or EGs, things where the toddler is awake and we can really give visual attention tests and then as well as eye tracking tests and kind of map those jointly to get better information. You mentioned before that you were interested in genetics. So are, is there a possibility then of linking the way the brains are acting to specific genes? 
You know, that would be great. I am definitely not a geneticist, but we're doing some genetic research in our laboratory. Um, we're looking at genes that regulate kind of um, kind of bring growth, like CHD8, for example, because as I said, one of kind of really a common feature of autism is if you look post-mortem, particularly in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, you're finding about a 67% increase in the number of neurons. And so that's a clue because we're finding, that's the average, but we're finding ranges within individual subjects. And everybody seems to be having this increase. And so obviously frontal cortex is really important for social behavior um, and social attention. And so how this all can link up, we're not sure. As far as the genes that might relate to this, I think um, geneticists are maybe a little bit far away from getting a little bit of closure on the genetic social attention link, but I, I think it's an important endeavor, and we've got some gene expression research going on right now that will be looking into this. I'm part of a committee that looks at uh, Alzheimer's disease sequencing, and to get to a really sophisticated level, you need hundreds or even thousands yeah, of patients. Yeah, you need large sample sizes. And, and, and the thing those people have in common is a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. But if it's true that autism isn't just one entity, that there are multiple entities that produce behaviors that are very similar, then, you know, that's a challenge. It'll be a challenge. That's why the stuff that you're doing, the ability to phenotype, you know, that's really right. examine. That's right. We've got deep phenotyping. We're doing, yeah, a lot of different eye tracking tests. We can actually, we're doing a lot of just videotaping how the children play with their parents. Mm -hmm. um, just a whole host of language tests and IQ tests and, you know, just a lot of great things. And, and we do work with the Simons Foundation to kind of build the largest a database for genetics and autism that the world has seen. So we have, a, you know, the Spark study, and so each site contributes around, you know, 3,000 patients, and so they're going to be getting around probably 100,000 trios, ultimately. And so that's so, going to be great. Yeah, they'll have large sample sizes to be looking at these kind of phenotype genetic relationships that are going to be really important. That's great. So when you look at the field right now, what do we do for these little kids, and when do we start doing it? You know. If that's an excellent question. I certainly have the philosophy that earlier is better. I don't know if you've um, heard of that paper. There aren't a lot of human studies really looking at kind of early plasticity and critical periods, but there's a paper in Science by Chuck Nelson. Long story short, there are these kids dropped off in an orphanage in Bucharest, Romania, left there. Half of them uh, went into foster care. Half of them, unfortunately, stayed in the institution because they didn't have enough space. If you looked at the age that the kids got out of the institution and placed into a nice loving home with foster care, the later that the children got out of that really negative, cold, non-enriched environment, the worse their IQ was. So you compare the IQs of the kids that stayed in the institution, the kids got out during really early development, and there's like a 15-point IQ difference. Yeah. So early really does matter. So when you say what do you do for autism, I think we detect it as early as possible. You provide a great nurturing environment that's naturalistic in the home with some play therapy. You can empower the parents, give them information about what they can and can't do um, to help stimulate their child. I mean, you can be in a supermarket and just sort of orient your child to certain things in the supermarket. You don't ha it doesn't have to be something majorly strong. Structured. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, it, it looks like a larger quantity might be more beneficial than less. But it's kind of a, a just a combination of early is better and getting in there and doing some play therapy to, to stimulate social behavior and language behavior as early as possible. So the underlying theme of therapies that seem to work is stimulating social behavior, making it comfortable to interact socially. Yes, I mean, there are different types of naturalistic developmental therapies. They're all, a lot of them are based on an ABA applied behavior analysis model. So there's different variants, but very often you just have a bunch of objects and they use that to stimulate language and social behavior. Because one of the biggest problems for toddlers with autism is this sort of joint attention. So you and I look at each other, if I looked at that cup for long enough, eventually you'd look at it because you'd say, oh, Karen's looking at this. It's a merging of attention, this sort of triangle of attention between two people and an object. Well, that's a foundational problem for toddlers with autism. Um, they are not looking at where other people are paying attention, so they're not being able to shift their attention to key things in the environment, and that kind of starts as a foundational problem. So a lot of these therapies will focus on joint, so what we call joint social attention, as well as language and you know positive affect, getting the kids to laugh. I mean, these are all really important skills to learn during early development. For all of us, as well yes. as for those, those folks that uh, are born with a problem called autism, we're really proud of what you're doing. Thank we're, you. We're very hopeful that this uh, terrific relationship with the pediatricians is making it possible to collect a great deal of really careful clinical data, that the genes that are attached to that will be known in time, and that in any case, you'll continue to play an important role in understanding and treating autism. Thank you, Karen, for being here. Thank you so much, Bill, for inviting me. Appreciate it. Bill Mobley for The Brain Channel.